All right, start with disclosures. So um, I received travel assistance and an honorarium to give this presentation from Vision RT, and also UAB has a research and product development agreement with Varian, but none of the work featured in this talk was funded by um, either one of those companies, so. So um, as I said, I work at University of Alabama, Birmingham. This is our center that we have downtown. It's the Hazel Rigg Salter Radiation Oncology Center. And at this center, we have four clinics. We also have several satellite clinics. And all of our clinic, um, clinics are Varian. So we have a long history of doing SRS at UAB. We used to have a very active gamma knife program, but it was decommissioned in 2017. So in this graph, you can see the number of cases that we're doing per year. Blue is in gamma knife and green is, um, green is by Linac. So you can see in 2017, we did one gamma knife case. And then everything from then on has been done on our Linac. So since about 1995, we've done nearly 7,000 SRS cases. So all of our SRS right now at UAB is done on our edge linear accelerator. And we have that equipped with HyperArc. And because we have, hi hi because we have HyperArc, um, our immobilization system is the Encompass Mass done by QFIX. And all of our patients are monitored with our optical surface monitoring system. So we use this as a monitoring tool. We don't use it for setup. Um, we really just care about monitor monitoring the patient for motion. We're not super concerned about the accuracy of the initial setup. We were also the first clinic in the US to utilize HyperArc. So you can see here, these are a few articles that we have published and some news articles about being the first clinic to do that. If anyone isn't super familiar with HyperArc, it is a treatment planning and delivery component within Eclipse and Aria. You can fully automate delivery so that the therapists don't have to go into the room to rotate the couch. And it also has a planning module that's supposed to allow clinics to give high quality plans without very experienced planners. And part of um, using HyperArc is using this Encompass immobilization immobilization system because this is what they use to map the collision of the patient so that they know that you're not going to have any collision events. So um, this is what you have to use to ensure that that won't happen. So um, up to date, up to March, we had treated 255 HyperArc plans. So out of all of our SRS plans, this is about 93% of them. We treated a, a wide range of targets and 636 targets total. So who's not getting HyperArc at UAB? So we don't treat our functional patients, so our trigems, our central tremor patients, those are all treated with a different modality. Um, if we have a patient that they're outside of that safety zone where, where um, HyperArc thinks that there may be a collision, then we just go back to tra traditional SRS planning. And very infrequently, sometimes when we use HyperArc, we get plans that our physicians think aren't clinically acceptable, and our dosimetrists will go back and replan those just with our traditional methods and get a superior plan, and then we will treat with um, that better plan. So when we started our SRS SGRT program at UAB, we had a few goals in mind. We really wanted um, to create a systematic way of, of creating our regions of interest. And the reason that we did this is because there can be a lot of variation from person to person when you're creating a, an ROI and hand drawing them. And so we wanted to create a very systematic way to help, um, help them be consistent as possible. We also wanted to analyze the performance of OSMS at non-zero couch angles. So I'm sure everybody's had experiences or they've heard anecdotal um, um, talks about how when you rotate the couch you get increased inaccuracy so we really wanted to make sure that we could characterize those behaviors and we really wanted to collect as much data as possible at specific time points during treatments for all of our patients. So starting with our regions of interest, this is um, how we typically create our ROIs. They're all done within the treatment planning system. During simulation, we wire the, out, um, the outside of the open face mask so that we can easily see that outline in the CT scan. Then our um, dosimetrists, they contour that region. They cut back a little bit from the surface of the mask so that we know that we're not including any mask within that contour. We also exclude the eyes. Then we export that structure to AlignRT, and that is our, um, our region of interest. 
One thing that we also noticed when we were tre treating patients that was that we were seeing a lot of drift in the vertical direction. So one study that we did is that we took a stationary phantom and we put it on the table and then we just watched it over a large period of time. And so if you can see in this graph at the bottom we have time and then on one side we have the vertical RTD and on the, on the left we have the board temperature. So if you stand underneath your camera pods and you look up, it will kind of cycle through several different temperatures. There's an ambient temperature and there's a board temperature. So this is regarding the board temperature. And you can see that as the um, projectors warm up, the vertical RTD starts to drift with time and it stabilizes about 10 or 15 minutes after. And I just want to point out that this is not camera temperature. So people say, you know, keep your cameras on, don't turn your cameras off. Um, this is actually when you push that button to monitor and that speckly pattern comes on and you're actually monitoring the patient. So what we do is that we turn this on about 10 minutes before the patient comes in the room and we don't turn it off because it cools down kind of quickly. So we have like a 15 minute period where we're monitoring the patient before they're actually in the room. So this is an outline of our workflows. It's kind of busy, but I'll, I'll try to walk you through it quickly. Um, back in an earlier version of the software, you didn't have continuous logging of real-time deltas. And so our workaround was to use that little report button at specific time points throughout treatment to collect data. And it would take the RTDs and put them into a file, and then we would collect all of that data in to get a comprehensive picture of how much the patient had moved. So when our patient comes in the room, our therapists align them to the simulation marks. And then we take a report about how close that they got or how, how close OSMS thinks they are to their position. Then we can kind of fine tune their head position. We don't position them exactly according to OSMS, but we can try to kind of get out any tilt or exaggerated roll before we put that top of the mask on. Then we perform KV orthosets, perform the shifts. Then we take a comb beam CT and perform those shifts. If they're under a certain threshold, then we can just continue to treatment. If not, then we perform the shifts again until we're under that threshold, then we capture a reference surface and then immediately begin treatment. If at any time our, our um, limits are exceeded on our OSMS system, then we can stop. If the patient settles back down, we can continue treating. If the numbers stay high, then what we usually do is we go back to couch zero to our reference position and monitor at that at that position, because that's the most stable position that we've seen with our system. If the limits are still exceeded, then we comb beam the patient again, and we can capture a new reference surface and continue with treatment. So when we were doing these reports, what we also did was that we heard all these anecdotal tales that your numbers would change a lot when your cameras were blocked by the gantry. So our physicists would sit at the console and we would watch for the gantry to come up and hit that angle. And we would snap a report when we saw that um, a pod was blocked, blocked by the gantry. And then we, we would just repeat that anytime it would happen. And then at the very end of treatment, we return to the reference position to get that final difference between beginning of treatment to end of treatment, and then we end the treatment. So now that we have continuous logging, all we do is take that log file and we match it up to the, um, to the database and ARIA, and we can correspond the time points of when the beam on happened, where they were, and the gantry motion, and we can, we can make like a, a mapping between the two with some in-house software. We also have a little report log that we leave um, at, at the treatment unit for the therapist to fill out. So if anything out of the ordinary happens, if the system crashes, if they have to take three reference surfaces for some reason, like the, phys um, the physician has to go in and talk to the patient or something like that, then we have kind of a cohesive storyline of what has happened throughout that treatment. So um, over the past few years, we've been evaluating our OSMS system over three time periods. The initial time period was prior to advanced camera optimization. Then we had a time period where we had ACO, but it was before um, OSMS had released this customer information bulletin about how to perform a cold calibration. So we had a short time period there. And then after we got this um, customer information bulletin, um, we, we've been tracking ever since then. And I want to just comment that all of the data I'm about to show excludes patients that have had multiple reference captures. So about, we've looked at over 900 fractions of treatment and about 4% of them have been excluded because the patient was um, confirmed through CBCT to have moved. And the reason that we exclude those is because once we have multiple reference captures, we've kind of broken that storyline and we no longer have a picture of how much they've moved from where they were initially at the very beginning of treatment to the end. So in our initial experience pre-ACO, we looked at 223 fractions. So um, the median movement for a patient from beginning to end of treatment was 0.29 millimeters. And in this graph here, this is the longitudinal 
real-time delta before beam on at non-zero couch angles. And so you can see that the median value for that is about 0.8 millimeters. So you can see that when we rotate the couch, we're getting much larger numbers than what we're seeing when we, we return the patient to the reference position. And what we notice is that that's varied a lot from patient to patient. Some patients you would rotate the couch and you would see barely any change, and other patients you could see very large changes up to one to two millimeters. And what we found when we plotted these real-time deltas, um, we, we plotted them with respect to the distance their lesion was to the tracking surface. So if we had a lesion that was very anterior, we had great results. As you started to move towards the back of the head, that's where we started to see these larger walkouts. So um, that's on the right side. You can he see here where we have the real-time delta versus vertical isocenter ROI offset. And we also saw a lot of false positives. So that would, what we consider to be a false positive is if you rotate the couch and you see an RTD larger than one millimeter, but you return to couch zero and your RTD is less than half a millimeter. So these were numbers that we picked were you know, representative of, okay, we're rotating the couch and we're seeing really large numbers, but when we come back, it doesn't seem like they have moved at all. So then we received cam um, advanced camera optimization. So this is a service performed calibration procedure and what they do is instead of calibrating to that isocenter plate, they're calibrating over a volume. And this is that same data now before and after ACO. So you can see that uh, in pink here, we had that dependence on isocenter location and after ACO, it has flattened out. So we no longer have so much variation for where the isocenter is located within the patient. And here is this just by the numbers, how many fractions we treated. The movement from beginning to end of treatment was relatively the same, 0.3 versus 0.33. Um, a slight decrease in the median value before beam on at non-zero couch angles, but we got rid of that dependence on um, isocenter location. And we also had a small decrease in our rate of false positives. So to further characterize this behavior, um, we had this very sophisticated phantom, which is a styrofoam head and we called him Styrohead, and we embedded a tungsten BB into his head to do some testing. And I had to call around to all the craft stores in Birmingham and say, do you have any heads for sale? And do you have any flesh-colored paint maybe? And so then I figured now I'm like on an FBI watch list somewhere, so. We put the BB in a couple different places. We put one like directly on the ROI surface, one we tried to get like right in the middle of the head, and one we just taped right on the back of his head. And this pink area right here is what the ROI would look like. We tried to make it representative of a patient, and so we, didn't, we wanted to include what would be visible in an open face mask. So this is just a, a little graphic of the test that we did. We put Styrohead on the table, and we aligned um, the BB by comb beam. Then we just pretty much did like a Winston Lutz test where we rotate the couch around. We map the BB location and how much it's walking out with the couch, and then we also recorded the RTDs at the same time. So um, I know this graph is a little bit busy, but if you look at the circles, those are the RTDs. The little crosses are the walk out of the couch. So you can see that the walk out of the couch is all with less than half a millimeter. Um, before we got ACO, you can see that our walkout could be greater than 1.5 millimeters when we walk the couch out. Um, after we got ACO, you can see that that goes down to blue, so it's pretty much equivalent to what it was for an anterior lesion. So this was consistent with our patient data that once we got ACO, we're not seeing that dependence on where your lesion is with how accurate you are when you rotate the couch. So our next time period came after we got this customer information bulletin. And this is where they uh, recommended a new workflow for performing the MV Isocenter calibration. So that's where you take the little cube and you take all the MV images and it's supposed to fine tune your Isocenter position. And what they said was instead of monitoring that cube and letting your projectors and cameras warm up, you just take a little picture snapshot and so the system doesn't get warm. So this was the exact opposite of what we were doing because it made intuitive sense for us. You know, we treat warm, we don't want those RTDs drifting during treatment, so we should calibrate warm. So we were putting our phantom on the table and like letting it sit there for 20 minutes before we did our calibration. So we didn't do that anymore after we got this bulletin. So instead of um, calibrating like 15, 20 minutes in, we we're just taking that snapshot and we're calibrating at like a lower board temperature. And at UAB, we call this cold calibration. 
So before we did our cold calibration, we did that phantom test with Styrohead and we put them on the table. And you can see that our walkouts are all are about like around one millimeter. And then we performed cold calibration and then did it again. You can see that they all went under half a millimeter. So we got um, a, a lot of improvement from doing this cold calibration process. So this is patient data. So these are probability maps versus RTD magnitude. So on the left is before the cold calibration. Um, red is after, after the last non coplanar beam, and blue is at the end of treatment. And you can see that after CIB, those, those um, probabilities get much closer together. And this is the same thing just for our three time periods. Before we got ACO, after we have ACO, before we did the CIB calibration, and then after CIB. And you can see that we, we got up a lot of improvement when we went to that CIB um, calibration protocol. So this is just same thing by the numbers. At the end of treatment, the numbers are all pretty consistent. We got a very um, big de decrease in our patient numbers. The median dropped down to about 0.57 millimeters. And we no longer have that dependence on isocenter position. And our rate of false, po false, false positives dropped down to about 12%. So you can see doing that cold calibration procedure really didn't make a big difference in what we were seeing as we rotated the couch. So for monthly QA, um, we wanted to have our QA process be as similar to treating a patient as possible. So using that cube is not representative of what a patient looks like. So we stuck with our styrofoam head, with our tungsten ball. We put it on the table. We basically do the exact same, same thing that we did in our phantom studies. We take our images, we evaluate them, and we don't recalibrate unless these, res these results deviate from baseline. Because if you put the plate down and you do a monthly calibration, it, it like wipes out your MV isocenter calibration. You have to start the whole thing over. And we, we figured that that would bring more uncertainty of having to repeat that frequently. So we just monitor the system. If we start to see deviations, then we can go through a calibration procedure. And this is just an example of some um, calibration results. Um, you can see we were starting to see larger deviations than we expected. Some of them were uh, approaching 0.8 millimeters, and that was a sign to us that something had happened. A camera had been bumped. Something um, had caused our process to change. So we calibrate. You know, we keep monitoring, and typically our results uh, hover under 0.3 millimeters. So. Um, our final recommendations for using OSMS for um, SRS is, you know, if you see thermal drift, warm up your projectors before your patients come in. You don't want that drift of a half a millimeter to happen when the patient's on the table because it's drifting for about 15 or 20 minutes, and our average treatments are about four minutes on our edge. Um, if you have couch walkout, everybody does. You have to know what it is. Every machine is different. You need to know if you rotate to one couch, is it larger if you rotate to the other couch? So that way when the neurosurgeons and the physicians are there and you go to couch 90 and your RTDs jump up, they don't have a heart attack. If you want to get rid of that dependence on ISIS Center, get the advanced camera optimization upgrade. Um, pull um, perform the cold calibration that really improved our performance at non-zero couch angles. And then just... Um, I want to say that we always go back to couch zero to confirm if a patient has a true offset or not. So if we rotate the couch and we see something large, we rotate back to couch zero. We monitor the patient there. If there's any question, we recomb beam. We never shift patients off what we see on OSMS. We always comb beam, snap a new reference surface, um, and then just repeat imaging as many times as you need until you're comfortable. So I want to thank our team. We have a really great radio surgery team, especially um, my boss, Dr. Popple and Dr. Fiabash. Um, and I'll take any questions at this time. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so now, now I can speak normally. <laughs> um, so when you're doing the cold calibration, do you um, do you set up the phantom with? with the cameras on, and then do you have to wait for it to cool down? No, basically you just, you're taking like snapshots. So I line up to lasers, and then I push the little snapshot button, and it just takes a picture, and it'll tell you what your RTDs are. So then I, you know, try to shuffle it around a little bit, take another picture. I never turn on monitoring. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, <laughs> The, the, the data that you presented on the false positives, can you tell a little bit more about like what that is? So does that mean, is one false positive that means any time during a patient's treatment, if, if there was a false positive, that, that counts as, as one? Or is that looking at real-time deltas throughout the treatment and seeing how often during a treatment 
something is out of tolerance when it really shouldn't be. It means before BMON at a non-zero couch angle, if the RTDs are greater than one millimeter, but the RTD at the end of treatment is less than half a millimeter, we consider that to be a false positive. Okay, okay. And then one other really quick question about the workflow you presented at the beginning. Mm -hmm. It looked like the first time you captured a reference image was after you do the um, uh, comb beam CT and do the, 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 the match and it's under half a millimeter, half a degree. So the question, how do you um, how do you tie? So how do you know while you're looking at the comb beam CT doing the auto fusion, it's being approved by a physician or whatever your workflow is? How do you know that between then and when you capture that reference in image, there was no movement of the patient? That we d I mean we d we've talked about that. It's like, do you capture a reference before and then you image them and then you do it again? We're just going very very quickly, and somebody's always looking at the patient to make sure they're not moving. We're approving the comb beam really quickly, immediately capture a reference surface, and then just go into treatment. Just try to be efficient as possible. Thank you. Sorry. You do a cold calibration, but then you turn the cameras on about 20 minutes before the patient comes into the room. Can you clarify? Yes, Thank you. I know. It doesn't make intuitive sense, and I don't understand why the cold calibration works better, but the reason we do that is because you're always going to treat warm, and if you don't warm up the cameras before the patient comes in the room, then the worst part of the drift is happening in the middle of the treatment. So as soon as you turn that speckledy pattern on and you start monitoring, you start to get that drift. And the, it can be per perceived as patient motion. So we're just trying to eliminate that happening during treatment. So it's either gonna happen before they come in or it's gonna happen in the middle of their treatment. So we choose to let it happen before. Can I just very quickly add to that as well? Um, the reason that the recommendation is to calibrate the system uh, when it's cold is that we're applying a relative shift to the isocenter, the calibrated isocenter location. And when you perform your monthly calibration with the large calibration plate, typically the Align RT is cold. It hasn't been on monitoring the patient. So we want to apply a shift to that isocenter with the cameras in the same condition uh, for both the plate and the cube. Um, once you have that shift calculated, it's going to be consistent whether the cameras are cold or hot. So it is the same is going to apply as the cameras warm up as well. So, so that's the rationale. And if there's any questions, I can ask, answer afterwards. Yes, please ask him. <laughs> can I just also add a couple of points? Um, with the cold calibration, you, you can monitor uh, the cube continuously. But if you stop monitoring while you're taking your MV images, and, and processing those MV images, and then just do a, a, a capture, just a, a, a treatment capture, a snapshot, like Dr. Covington said, um, at the end of that process, and that's enough time for, for the cameras to have cooled down uh, and, and taken away that, that uh, any thermal changes there. So that's a workflow you can use as well. Um, and, and also, um, with regard to kind of monitoring the patient, and making sure they haven't moved during the acquisition of the comium CT and doing the, the match, et cetera. I mean, you, you can have a line RT on and monitor that patient. If you see that the patient's moved on the line RT, then you'll know that the patient actually moved um, during the course of that comium or after the comium was, was acquired. Thank you, Ben and Adrian. Do we have any additional questions? All right, thank you very Thanks. much, Dr. Covington.